Notebook 16 Death in Montcornier, the 296th, goes to Argonne. From the 26th of April, 1917, to the 1st of July, 1917. Part 1 Last time, we left as Barthas and his friend Vidal went to the city of chalon sur marne to obtain a replacement cannon for their gun team. Unfortunately, all they were given was a useless half-cannon without a gun carriage, something which caused them much worry about the possible reaction of Lieutenant Loriot, a moody man, especially if drunk, when he found out. We shall now see how things went after that. Barthas and Vidal were getting ready to depart the town of Chalon at 10 a.m., but before that they wished to enjoy some breakfast. Unfortunately, at that time there was an obscure regulation that forbid soldiers from getting food and drink outside the time between 11 a.m. and 1 p.m., and none of the restaurants in the area dared to serve them breakfast and break this rule. The previous evening, the two of them had bought some wine and a couple of eggs at a small establishment. They tried going there to ask the merchant if he could at least cook their eggs, but again they got the inflexible no. The Poilus were about to give up when a woman at the establishment offered to take them and cook the eggs at her place. Barthas wrote that they would have easily kissed the woman on both cheeks, even despite her uncertain age. In his own words, from the rear the woman appeared to be twenty-five, in profile thirty, and in the face at least thirty-six. Her clothes were dirty and her hair was a mess. At that moment they didn't pay it much mind. But then, after following the woman through some narrow streets, they reached her abode of cracked walls made of bare grey stone. When she opened the door, they were greeted by a revolting sight. There was filth everywhere, and the table seemed to be perpetually set and never cleared, with the dishes looking like they hadn't been cleaned in weeks. Without a care in the world, the woman went and grabbed a pan which was being licked by a mangy dog and a skinny cat. Without even bothering to wipe the pan, the woman broke the polus eggs on it. At that moment, Barthas and Vidal declared that they suddenly felt ill and couldn't eat. The confused woman ended up appropriating the eggs for herself and her ragged kid, who had just appeared by the door. She then proceeded to talk unceasingly with them. She rambled about how she was burdened with a bad-tempered old husband of sixty who never laughed, while she still felt young and so on, and so forth. The two Palus could no longer take it, and they left the place, all the while giving the woman false promises that they would be very happy to be her guests the next time they went to the town. That day, the two of them had a piece of bread and a can of sardines for breakfast. Later that evening, they rejoined their company at the town of billy le grand and Barthas presented the half-cannon to Lieutenant Lorieux. The lieutenant was furious, but he listened to Barthas's explanation and was mollified by the arsenal's promise that they would be sent the gun carriage as soon as it arrived. Either way, he did not find fault with Barthas's actions. And the days passed. The police hoped that the complete failure of the great offensive that had been launched back on the 16th of April would have made their generals realize that it was fruitless to keep trying to do the same thing. But this turned out to be nothing but wishful thinking. When their regiment had been pulled out, they won nothing but a temporary respite, and again they were marked for sacrifice in the trenches. But for the next eight days, everything was a mess of orders and counter-orders. One day they were assigned to a certain division, only to learn the next day that they would replace a completely different one. Abruptly, they were told that they were to depart for the front that very evening, only for a telephone call at the last minute, which postponed the departure for the next day, then the next one, and then the day after that. One morning, the squad leaders rushed to reconnoiter a sector they were supposed to occupy the next day, only for the orderlies to go running to bring them back, as they had just been assigned to a different sector. This demonstration of the chaos which reigned over their high command profoundly demoralized the Poilus. But Barthas wrote that no one cared about what the soldiers felt. All they cared about was that they march when told to do so.
Barth has learned from his lieutenant that in one of those days, Colonel Robert had assembled his officers for a conference, when suddenly an officer from headquarters, dressed as if for a parade, burst in bringing new orders. They were being sent to a hill known as Montcornier. When the colonel heard this, he got up and furiously told the parade officer, Tell your general that he makes me mad as hell. I've had it with these orders and counter-orders the past week. Tell him that my regiment is not going to attack until the barbed wire has been blown. And tell him that if I'm holding them up, let them come and tell it to my face. Eventually, after all of this, on the 27th of April, the battalion left billy le for the trenches at Montcornier. At nightfall, they camped at a half-ruined and empty village called Courmelois. The town suffered frequent bombardments, but, fortunately for them, that night the German guns aimed elsewhere. The next day, at twilight, the regiment moved up to the village of Rich. The village was close to the trenches. Shells landed there daily, and none of its original inhabitants remained. Then, on the 29th of April, the whole regiment moved up to the front lines. But Barthas had an unexpected stroke of good luck. Before leaving for the trenches, their gun group left an ammo dump at Vez, and the lieutenant assigned Barthas and his comrade Jalabert to stay in the village to stand guard over the dump, while also assuring liaison with their field kitchens and drivers that had stayed behind at Courmelois, and with the supply column and the rear echelon personnel who had stayed farther behind around the bridge of a town called Is. Barthas wrote that, for a change, that day the German artillery played a nasty trick on those rear echelon personnel as they were heavily bombarded. Many of the terrified slackers ended up pulling back several kilometers to sleep in a cold and damp aqueduct tunnel. Meanwhile, at the almost deserted town of Vige, Barthes and Jalabert discovered a house which was miraculously intact despite all the shelling, and they quickly settled in it. It turned out to be the church house of the village's priest and his housekeeper. It was full of religious paintings, crosses, statues of the Virgin and saints, Bibles, and books on the lives of saints. Parthas wrote that it was enough to convert an entire army of pagans. No furniture of any monetary value remained, but there were still two comfortable beds which they enjoyed greatly. To be in such luxury was enough to make them feel shame, as their comrades were suffering in the trenches. Still, as the days passed, the shelling on the village intensified, and soon enough Barthas and Jalabert were practically the only souls in it. One particular night, a shell fell far too close for comfort in the neighboring house. They noticed that amid all the rubble, the statue of the Virgin Mary, whether due to luck or miracle, was intact. Still, out of prudence, the two Poilus decided to move to a nearby shelter, despite the fact it was infested with large rats and lice as big as grains of wheat. Each night in that area, the field kitchens would move up closer to the trenches. Jalabert had to go get the wine, tobacco, and other provisions for their gun group, which, in Barthes' own words, Suzu Jalabert just fine, as it allowed him to go to the villages in the rear to enjoy himself, drink, and test the virtue of pretty champagne girls. Meanwhile, Barthes only had to go to the nearby town of Courmelois to grab their own provisions from the field kitchens. This involved going through a road which was occasionally shelled, and a swamp where the mud could reach one's knees, but, as Barthes wrote, they were living the easy life. While they spent their days like that, their comrades suffered in the trenches of Montcornier. The regiment was ordered to participate together with a division to their right in an attack set for the 30th of April at 7 a.m. This attack was then postponed for 12.40 p.m. In the morning of that same day, Colonel Robert, who had been coming out of his dugout, was suddenly wounded in the head by a shell fragment and died that same day at the first aid station. Barthas wrote that the death of the good colonel touched the regiment deeply, but at that time, in that inferno, no one had time to mourn. At the appointed hour, the Poilus of the 296th Regiment went over the top. 
they met almost no resistance and soon reached the third German line of trenches. Apparently, most of the Germans had either been massacred by the French artillery or had managed to get away, as they only caught around 100 prisoners. The 296th could have advanced more, but they had to stop, because the regiment to their right, the 47th, had met heavy machine gun fire from a strong point which could only be taken after several days. The next day, the Germans launched several counterattacks led by teams of grenadiers. The Poulouse had to begin yielding some terrain. At one point, ammunition was starting to run short, and still the Germans pressed forward, capturing some isolated groups. Barthes wrote that the situation was starting to become very serious when Lieutenant Guillot of the 13th Company showed evidence of an incredible coolness under fire that bordered on the superhuman. In the middle of all the chaos, the lieutenant, in his shirt sleeves, took command of all units at hand, grabbed a rifle, and led his men in a charge against the Germans, pushing them back from position after position until finally the Palouse stood in control of the first two enemy lines and the positions were fixed. The 296th Regiment had managed to advance 500 meters. Barthas wrote that for these few hundred meters, the generals would congratulate one another while the fat-bellied civilian patriots of the rear would be dazzled. Yet no matter how much they described it as a great and heroic victory in reality, like all the other times, these attacks were nothing but useless massacres. As an example, Barthas told of how one evening during this operation, a large work detail from the 14th Company was carrying ammunition up to the front line, when a German shell suddenly fell nearby. The shell set off some boxes of grenades and 15 men were killed or wounded. Among the dead was Captain Mikhail from the town of Bézier, near Barthes's hometown. The Germans focused enormous quantities of artillery against the attacks on that sector. Barthes wrote that the monstrous bombardments they unleashed there were even worse than Verdun. He himself saw a man being carried off from the trenches, driven raving mad by the shelling. He also received news that the lieutenant in command of the 17th Company lost his wits and had to be evacuated. Meanwhile, the 47th Regiment to their right flank finally managed to surround the German strongpoint that had been holding them up for days. However, the defenders had managed to hide and fortify themselves within the strongpoint's underground corridors, doubtless waiting to be relieved by a counterattack from their own side. Before this problem, the Palouse of the 47th simply blocked all the exits with sandbags and threw asphyxiating grenades into the tunnels. After that, the place was silent as a tomb. Another of war's sights. And Barthes wrote that the ones that carried this act out gave it no more thought than a hunter smoking out a fox. A few days later, on the 6th of May, Barthes found himself the receiver of bad luck as Sergeant Gauthier, the head of his gun team, fell sick. The sergeant had simply gotten a bad case of indigestion from eating uncooked beans, but during an offensive it was dangerous for a soldier to fall sick, as he would be looked upon with a great deal of suspicion from the higher-ups. Before this, the sergeant decided to not report himself sick, and asked Lieutenant Loriou for permission to go and rest for a couple of days with the field kitchens. Permission was granted, and the lieutenant sent orders for Barthas to replace the sergeant. With much regret, Barthas had to leave behind his comfortable life at the town of Vege and head for the sinister slopes of Mont Cornier, which burst with explosions and smoke like a volcano. Barthas was not familiar with the sector, but was told he had to reach the lieutenant's dugout at a place called the Marquise by following a nearby road. During the day, this road remained deserted, as it was in full view of the German artillery. During the night, it was the complete opposite. Both sides needed to send food and supplies to the trenches, so a tacit agreement had been established by both artilleries to not fire on the roads at night. Instead, they fired mercilessly at the trenches and the soldiers inside them. Unfortunately, Barthas could not profit of the night's safety as it was noon, and he had been ordered to head out as quickly as possible. He waited near the empty road to see if he could find someone to guide him. He had almost given up when finally two machine gunners carrying ammunition appeared 
and he joined them. The road they followed passed through a completely flat plain with no cover in sight. Barthas wrote that it was chilling to walk there, and know they were at the mercy of even the smallest shell. To protect the road from enemy eyes, grey cloth had been hung from the telegraph poles to the side, but in many places the shells had torn large holes in it, so it provided little comfort. Eventually, the plains ended and the road they followed started entering a forest. At its edge, the three Palus stopped and looked on in horror. The woods were being bombarded by the Germans. Explosions ravaged it and they saw how centuries-old trees were pulled out by their roots, shattered and thrown about like twigs. The whole forest creaked and groaned under the punishment. At that moment, from every corner of the woods appeared artillerymen from the 47th Regiment, fleeing from the devastation. We've been betrayed, they said. We move our guns every time, and every time we set up and camouflage new positions, the Germans target and fire on them. With this bombardment, fear had risen that a shell would set off their ammo reserves, so the order of every man for himself had been given. Barthas wrote that the artillerymen were lucky, as, unlike the infantrymen, they could run away at the first signs of danger. Still, the gunners told them that they could go through the forest road, as the Germans were not targeting it at the moment, and so Barthas and his companions continued forward. Barthas wrote that the information turned out to be less accurate than hoped for, as all along the road there were many quite recent craters with their edges still black with power. Barthas thought that the territorial road menders would have a lot of work the next night, but meanwhile the three Poilus only cared about getting out of there as fast as possible. The forest path was barely a kilometer long, yet it felt like six. They reached the other side panting and out of breath. They rested for a few minutes in a small shelter next to a roadkeeper's cabin, which had been torn open by a shell. Then they entered some narrow communication trenches and reached Les Marquis after thirty minutes. Les Marquis had either been a small village or a chateau, which one was impossible to tell, as it had all been reduced to nothing more than a pile of rubble. The field kitchens moved up here each evening, and there were also some supply depots and reserve units. Here was also the shelter where Colonel Robert had been killed. Apalou pointed out to Barth as a pile of ruins which he assured him had been a residence belonging to the beautiful and famous Madame Marguerite Steinherr, in whose arms it was said that President of the French Republic had died eighteen years before. Along one of the roads that passed through Les Marquises, several dugouts had been built. In one of these, Barthas found Lieutenant Lorry. The lieutenant helped him reach his gun team, which was installed about 500 meters from the contested Mont Cornier. From that distance, the hill looked like a whitish shape. Shelling had completely stripped off the dirt on its top and exposed the layers of clay below. Barthas found his comrade settled in a rather deep shelter that consisted of little more than a flight of stairs which went into the ground and at the bottom of which was a little square space, completely full of mortar rounds. The rounds had apparently been forgotten by whoever put them there. In that shelter, it would have been easy to be buried alive by a shell collapsing the entrance, and this was no baseless fear, as Barthas was told that once before a shell had detonated nearby and had almost completely blocked the entrance with dirt and mud. Fortunately, the men inside had had shovels and picks and managed to dig themselves out. Despite this danger, it was still considered precious refuge. The constant bombardments in the area would slowly collapse the shelters one by one. For cover, many of the men could only crouch in what bits of deeper trench they could find and stay there day and night, waiting for death or relief. As had been mentioned previously, during the day, the German artillery would focus on the roads, forests and villages in the rear, but at night they fired on the trench lines. Barthas and his team in their shelter constantly received men who had been moving around throughout the night on various work details and had been suddenly surprised by ferocious barrages. This meant they could not sleep, but Barthas wrote that it would have been cruel to complain when these other men were stuck moving outside with no rest 
and exposed to enemy fire. The team's gun itself was installed in a crater with its barrel constantly aimed at the edge of a wooded area which the Germans used for its abandoned cover. Barthas wrote that fortunately the Germans in that sector preferred bombardments to bayonet charges, so he was nothing but a spectator during his stay there. Finally, after several days, Sergeant Gauthier appeared at the shelter's entrance, finally recovered from his raw beans. Barthas immediately yielded his place to the sergeant and went back to the town of Verge with no regrets. At Verge, Barthas met his friend Jalabert, who welcomed him with great joy, as by now the village was completely empty. Besides Barthas and Jalabert, only two artillery spotters remained at the top of the town's church tower. The spotters had figured that the German artillery used the tower as a reference point, else they would have destroyed it by then. Time passed. The men reached the end of their strength, and each day waited anxiously for their relief. But their superiors didn't want to pull them out until, as in all offensives, they reached the expected percentage of casualties. In despair, some Frenchmen surrendered to the Germans, while some Germans surrendered to the French. Barthas wrote that the patriots of the rear would have called it cowardice, but for him it would have been beautiful if the armies had all surrendered, and the generals of both sides had been forced to fight each other with their own fists. Barthas's comrade Sabatier, whom we have seen sometimes before, was among the men who were taken prisoner by the Germans captured together with a friend when they had been on their way to a listening post. Barthas wrote that poor Sabatier, already dead by the time he was writing these lines after the war, had just been an illiterate and simple man who, like so many others, never understood why they were fighting this war. When Sabatier and his companion were captured, the Germans told them that their war was over, and that had been all they had asked for. Finally, on the 15th of May, the 296th Regiment reached the amount of bloodshed expected by their superiors. They were relieved from Montcornier during the night and headed for the village of Is. No official numbers of casualties were released, but Barthas wrote that according to his own reliable sources, the regiment had left the slopes of Montcornier with 150 dead, 350 wounded, and 100 missing. That would have been one man in five as casualties if the regiment had been at full strength, which theirs was most certainly not. Among the sad stories was that of Private Babu of the 13th Company, one of Parthas's comrades whom we've also seen before in this story. Babu had his own son as his sergeant. Parthas wrote that only war could create such a paradox where a father was forced to obey his son. Either way, the very day when the regiment had gone to the front line, the good Colonel Robert had the thought of holding back the oldest men in reserve, so they would have to rejoin their units only when any attacks or counterattacks were completed. But when Babu rejoined his half-section, he could no longer find his sergeant. He had been killed in a German counterattack, and Babu couldn't even get the consolation of knowing where his son's body lay and Barthas wrote that if their poor colonel had decided, like most other colonels, to march everyone forward, it would have been quite possible that both son and father would have died. So is war. Time passed. On Sunday, 20th of May, the 296th Regiment left the town of Ys. It was a tough march on dry roads under a hot sun. Eventually, they stopped for the day at a village called Compertry, a few hundred meters from the city of chalon sur mer In the evening, Barthas went with a friend to visit the nearby city. He wrote that it was almost impossible to find a glass of beer to drink with all the thousands of shirkers and rear-line personnel that soaked it up. These shirkers, who never suffered a day of combat, crowded the streets showing off their newest and shiniest kepis stripes and decorations. Most walked around with their wives or girlfriends in their arms. These women wore flowered hats and pretty dresses in festive colors. The people strolled around, smiling, gossiping, laughing and flirting in perfect, blissful tranquility 
even though one could hear the low roar of the cannons in the distance, indicating that blood was being shed. Ambulances came quietly to bring the wounded to the hospitals, and the cemeteries next to these hospitals grew larger each day. Barthas and his comrade left the place heartbroken by all this selfish indifference which insulted all the men in the trenches, men who were suffering and dying without even knowing why. The next day, early in the morning, the regiment passed through the silent city and continued on its way. They stopped at the small village of Lepin, and the Poilus admired its magnificent church, the Basilica of Notre-Dame de Lepin. It served as a destination for many pilgrims who came to drink from the sacred and miracle-working water obtained from a well within it. Barthas wrote that with his dry throat and drier canteen, he would have easily drunk a liter of the holy water, as there were no public wells or fountains in that town. But the church's doors were prudently locked, and he had to beg for a glass of water from a housewife who rushed to give him one. She explained that water was being very strictly rationed in the town. Eventually the regiment resumed its march, and they finally stopped for the day at the village of Somville. Next to the village's church they could see the ruins of several burned-out houses. The locals explained that recently another force had been built there. Unfortunately there was a tragic accident, as a group of grenades exploded and burned down some houses and part of the church. Five soldiers had been killed in an accident and they now lay amid the flowers of the church's cemetery. Even in this small village, war left its mark. The following day, the Poilus had to set out again and, after a long march, were finally billeted at the town of Dougour, the final stop for this particular journey. They spent nine days there to rest from the last offensive, the time being filled with the usual exhausting and annoying parades, reviews, and field exercises. And then the Russian Revolution broke out. But we will have to see what happened with that on the next episode. For now, we've reached the end of this first part of the 16th Notebook. I sincerely hope you've enjoyed it. I wish all of you a good day, and I will see you next time.